uniform spherical charge. So following our previous examples, the first question is, what is the total charge? And we'll follow the recipe that we outlined in the notes. So the first step, draw the problem. So we've done that over to the left. We've drawn a sphere and it has a uniform volume charge density rho sub V. Let's choose a coordinate system. How about spherical since it's a sphere? That makes sense. Write the general equation. So I go to the table in the notes that lays out the recipe and I pull out the equation for total charge for a volume charge problem. And it's a triple integral of the volume charge density times the differential volume. Next, we write expressions for all of the different things, which in this case is just rho sub V and dV. Well, rho sub V is just a constant, so that stays, stays rho sub V. Our differential volume, we go back to our table from the vector calculus where we had our differential lengths, surfaces, and volumes, and recall for spherical coordinates, the differential volume is R squared times sine theta dr d theta d phi. So we can take both of these and plug them back into our integral. After we do that, now we need to choose the limits of integration. And the trick to choosing the limits of integration is we want to somehow cover all the space inside the sphere with no voids and no overlaps. So for theta, that's the elevation angle. I'm going to take that all the way from the positive Z all the way down to negative Z. So that's going to go from zero to pi. This angle phi, I want to take all the way around. So that's going from zero to two pi. And then last, the radial direction, I'm going to go from the, the center out to radius r. I'm not going to go from negative r to r because then I would include twice the volume of the sphere. So just zero to r in that radial direction. So this is the integral from the previous slide. Now we want to solve it. How can we do this? Well, the first thing I'll do is I will bring any constants to the outside. So in this case, that's just rho v. The next thing I do is like to put my integrals into sort of a hierarchy. So first we're, we're integrating over theta, then phi, then r. So inside here, we can isolate this r integral. We're integrating r squared dr from zero to big R. So what's the antiderivative of r squared? Well, it's r cubed over three. So we'll evaluate this at big R, evaluate it at zero, subtract the two, and that's what we'll have inside these parentheses. So at zero, we just get zero. At big R, we get big R cubed over three. Those are both constants we can bring to the outside. So we have our r cubed over three. Well, now our integral over phi becomes very simple. That's just from zero to two pi of d phi. This just evaluates to two pi. And we bring the two pi to the outside. And now we're just left with an integral of sine theta d theta. This is the integral from the previous slide. We have yet to do the integration of sine theta d theta. What is the antiderivative of sine? It's negative cosine. So we'll evaluate negative cosine at pi and then subtract negative cosine evaluated at zero. And when we do that, the negative cosine of pi is a positive one. Negative cosine of zero, that's a negative one, but we're subtracting a negative one, so that's a positive one. And we end up with just one plus one inside here. So that's a two. And that can go up here with this two to become a four. And so total charge is the charge density times four pi r cubed over three. Well, where do we recognize this four pi r cubed over three? That's the volume of a sphere. So what we conclude then, as long as we have a uniform charge density, whatever this shape is, as long as we can somehow evaluate its volume V, the total charge will just be the charge density times that volume.
Now let's move on to the total electric flux. And mathematically, this gets a little deep. Uh, there's a couple areas where I will skip some details that are just algebra that I don't think are adding to the problem, but they're relatively minor. Following the recipe in the notes, step one is to draw the problem, and we've done that. Notice we're calculating the electric flux at a point on the z-axis. And in fact, we could be calculating the electric flux anywhere around this sphere, but due to symmetry, it will always be the same as the electric flux on the z-axis as long as we interpret that z-direction as the radial direction. So it makes the math easier to put that along the z-axis. Let's choose a coordinate system. Well, spherical makes sense since we're analyzing a spherical charge. Then we write the general equation. So we go to the notes from the table. We grab the equation for the electric flux density given a volume charge density. And this is independent of the coordinate system, which is really the next step to then write this in spherical coordinates. Now, we have this unit vector AR, that is a unit vector pointing from where we're integrating to the observation point. We already know due to symmetry that the, the radial components will cancel. We're only going to get a Z component. So in terms of the unit vector pointing from where we're integrating to our observation point, what is the Z component of that, given that this angle is alpha? Well, it's just going to be cosine alpha times the unit vector AR. And so we have that here. So if we put this in for the unit vector, we have our expression for the total electric flux with this Z component, if you will, of that radial vector. Let's continue writing expressions for each of the terms. Well, we have this differential volume dV. So we go to yet a, another table, and this was a table summarizing all of the vector calculus where we summarize the differential length, area, and volumes, and I grab the differential volume. And that is r squared sine theta dr d theta d phi. Now notice the prime superscripts. I'm using the prime superscripts as the coordinates of where we are in the integration. Without the primes, it's observation point or something else. The next, we're coming up with a strange equation and we're applying what's called the law of cosine. So focus your attention on the lower left here. So we have Pythagorean theorem, C squared equals A squared plus B squared, but that only works for a right triangle. What if it is not a right triangle? So I've drawn a triangle over here with some arbitrary angle theta. Its adjacent sides have length A and B and its opposite side has length C. So we can write sort of a generalization to the Pythagorean theorem that's called the law of cosine. So it starts off with the Pythagorean theorem, c squared equals a squared plus b squared, but then it subtracts sort of this correction term that's needed for not being a right triangle, minus 2ab cosine of that angle theta. Now up in the diagram, we have a triangle formed from the observation point to our integration point to the origin. So notice this triangle. And we'll write it first from this angle theta. And so the opposite is going to be r squared. It's the magnitude of this vector r. So r squared, big R squared equals z squared plus little r prime squared minus two z little r prime squared cosine theta prime. Now I can solve this equation for cosine theta prime and that's something that we'll need later. I can write yet again the law of cosines, but now focusing my attention on the angle alpha. So now it's this opposite side, which would be r prime, will be the new c, if you will. So little r prime squared equals z squared plus big r squared minus 2z big r cosine theta. And then I can solve that with for cosine theta, which well, I will need in a later step. Let's continue with, with uh, choosing the limits of integration. And 
we're, we're going to change a variable that we're integrating over. So we have a little bit of work to do before we actually choose the specific limits. So let's look at our DV. It turns out it's going to be a little bit easier to replace this theta prime and integrate over an R. So that's going to be the magnitude of this vector. So we'll keep the R prime here, a little R prime, but we wanna replace this theta prime. So we need to relate the D theta prime and DR. Well, previously we applied the law of cosines and we had this equation of relating our theta prime to R. So let's go ahead and differentiate that. And we will simplify this and we end up with a sine theta prime d theta prime equals r over zr dr. Just a little bit more work to do before we actually get to the limits of integration. So here's where we were on the previous slide. Remember our expression for dv. And remember from the law of cosines that we applied, we have an expression for cosine alpha that I said we'll use later. So we're using it now. Let's throw those things into the expression. All right, well, we can bring this, this 2ZR over to this expression. And then I like to keep this in the numerator and I'll write the expression for DV uh, outside here where the, the differential would normally go. Okay, so we swap things around. Here we are. Remember we had this relation sine theta prime d theta prime equals r over z little r prime dr. Well, we have a sine theta prime and then over here kind of one space away this d theta prime. So we can replace these two things with the expression on the right. So let's go ahead and do that. And we end up here. And now we can see we have an r that cancels with an r here. We can bring this z over here, get a z square. We can bring the r prime over. And here's our final form. That's the form now that we are going to assign the limits of integration to. We are finally in a position to define our limits of integration. So we're integrating over phi prime, r prime, and r. This was theta prime, but we've changed that over to r. So let's start with phi. Well, phi, like usual, will take all the way around, so that's zero to two pi. In the radial direction, we'll go from the origin to the edge of the sphere, so that'll be a distance a. We're calling the radius of the sphere a because we're running out of r variables. We don't wanna go from minus radius a to positive radius a because then we would be integrating over our sphere twice. We wanna choose our limits so that we perfectly cover the volume of the sphere without any voids, without any overlaps. Last, we need to consider this R. So we were integrating from theta prime equals zero to theta prime equals pi. So let's think about what R would be for those two cases. Remember what R is, it's the magnitude of the vector connecting where we're integrating from our differential volume to the observation point. So we would start with theta zero. So when theta zero, we are somewhere along the z-axis where we're integrating. And so the magnitude of the r vector would simply connect wherever we're integrating up to the observation point. That is z minus little r prime. And so that's what the lower limit is. Now, if theta is pi, so we're all the way down now below the xy plane, and we're somewhere down here, and so the magnitude of r would be the distance from our integration point below the xy plane all the way up to our observation point. And it turns out that length is z plus r prime. So we're ready to integrate. And the first thing I notice is that this phi integral is sitting all by itself. Nothing's a, a function of phi or phi prime, I should say. So the integral of phi prime equals zero to two pi d phi prime, well, that's just two pi and we can bring the two pi to the outside, that cancels with the eight pi, we're just left with a four in the denominator. Now we're integrating the function in here with respect to big R. Well, this z minus little r prime squared, this is just a constant. So in a way it's a constant multiplying one over r squared, that's easy to integrate, and also a one, also easy to integrate. So we'll calculate the antiderivative of that, and we just end up with an r, in the denominator and an r up here for the one. And so we'll evaluate this expression at z plus r prime 
and evaluate this expression, z minus r prime, subtract the two. So we can go ahead and do that. And this is a lot of algebra, but just algebra. So in the end, the answer is 4r prime. So this is one of those areas where I'm skipping a little bit of work, but uh, it's just algebra. So here's our new integral. We have this 4r prime multiplying an r prime dr prime. So these two r primes can come together, get an r prime squared. The 4 can come to the outside and cancel this 4, so we have no more 4s. This r prime squared is very easy to integrate. So the antiderivative of that is r prime cubed over 3, and we're, of course, evaluating that from 0 to a. We'll bring the 3 to the outside, so really we'll just have a cubed minus 0 cubed, and of course the 0 cubed is just 0, and we're left with an a cubed. So the final answer for d total is this. Now, we had a z squared in here, but I like to put it in the form with an r there. And I know r is something that we already use, but remember, we're trying to generalize this point along the z axis to any point. And so if we put this in the r direction, that would be a distance r. So really, the second expression is the final equation for the total electric flux outside of that sphere. Let's think about this a little bit because we can write this slightly differently. Remember that the total charge was the volume charge density times four pi r cubed over three. This is the volume of the sphere. Well, there's a lot of common terms here up there. And in fact, we can write the electric flux density in terms of that total charge. So the total flux density is total charge divided by four pi r squared in the AR direction. And if you remember, this is the same equation that we use for a point charge. So in fact, a spherical charge that has a uniform charge density outside of that acts the same as if it was a point charge right at its center.